Good morning and welcome to this morning's class. We'll pray and then we'll continue in Acts chapter 6. I'll begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this new week ahead of us. Thank you, Lord, that we start off this week with your promises. And Lord, that we derive from your strength, Father. And Lord, even as we take time to equip ourselves in the word of God, Lord, we believe that uh, a great investment is being made, Lord, in our spirits. And Father God, it will bear fruit, Lord, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Father God, uh, we thank you once again for your powerful word. Help us to understand it. Help us, Lord, to uh, plant it, O oh God, in good soil of our hearts. We bless and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we were in Acts chapter 6 and we saw how there was a problem. Okay. Uh, we saw that there was a problem with the food distribution. There was some kind of a misunderstanding because there were two communities of people and the Greek-speaking Jews felt that food was not being distributed uh, equitably to their widows. So when the problem was reached out, given to the leaders, they tried to find a solution. So that's a good thing. So we said how important it is to take care of the people and find a godly solution. Obviously, they themselves could not spend time doing these uh, practical ministry uh, tasks. So the wisdom that God gave them was to appoint leaders. We saw there were seven men who were chosen. The qualification uh, for, for their uh, volunteering ministry was quite high. The bar was quite high. We saw how they needed to be men of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, good reputation, and then they were chosen. Among them, we read regarding Stephen. So he's also, in verse 8, called as full of faith and power. He also did great wonders and signs among the people. So a really mighty man, we could say. And now we are going to learn more about Stephen. So Stephen... Uh, how he is going to be persecuted, how he's going to respond to his persecutors. And later on in Acts chapter 7, we will see that he was martyred for Christ. So the first martyr in the uh, early church, who's been mentioned in the book of Luke is Stephen. So let's uh, read what happened. So here is Stephen and uh, against him, you know, there arose some people from a certain group. So there is the group mentioned in verse 9 there. They are from the synagogue of the freedmen. They are the Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia. Who is another person from Cilicia? I'm asking us because we've finished uh, the series in church. So if anyone has tracked with the sermon series any who was from who hailed from cilicia okay let me give you a clue famous personality in acts no paul correct paul okay so paul is from cilicia that region why are we mentioning um Paul right now, towards the end of chapter 7, you'll notice that Saul was involved in the persecution of Stephen. So he was also part of this group of leaders who was giving approval for the killing of Stephen. So you can imagine what a, what a tough man Paul was. So he's part of this. He's part of the uh, uh, martyrdom, like the people who oppose Stephen, Paul is a part of that group. So that's what we have to understand. That's the reason I asked you the question. So Paul is there. There is this group of leaders. One of them is, at the time, you know, they, he was uh, more well known as Saul. He had two names, Saul and Paul. So he's uh, more well known as Saul. So they were all resisting him. And uh, uh, when 
Stephen spoke back, though he was a volunteer in the church, we will see how rooted and grounded he was in the word of God. He was able to respond well to the questions that people were asking. And verse 10 says, they could not resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. You remember earlier we discussed God, Jesus said that when you need to speak, I will give you the words. So God gave, the Holy Spirit gave Stephen words to answer these people. Now, what they started telling about him is that uh, he has spoken blasphemous words against Moses and God. That was the accusation. Was it true or not? They were, you know, we they did not um, confirm that, but they accused him and said, This man, he's speaking against Moses. Moses is their father, so they can't take it. And against God, these are people of God, the Jews, so they can't take it. And they are, um, you know, spewing anger against Stephen. So they stirred the people up uh, and, uh, you know, all the elders and everyone, they seized him, brought him to the council. We wonder why they picked only Stephen. You know, why not anyone else? We don't have an answer to that. Uh, but Stephen, as Luke is writing, seems like a very mighty man in the spirit. Uh, you know, a man of faith, a man who was moving in signs and wonders. So maybe his name was more well known. So they caught him, they accused him of blasphemy, and, uh, uh, you know, they brought him to the council now. And he has to answer. If we recall the trials of the earlier apostles, they all stood before the council and they had to give an answer. So that's where he's at right now. Uh, and uh, added added to you know this this thought that he spoke against Moses and God verse fourteen they are saying for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us so Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the place you know all kinds of uh, accusations they are bringing against him so here he is standing before the Council. How do you think a person under trial should look their expressions or their appearance? You and I, if we were before a council for interrogation, how might we look? We are scared expression and a very dull. We have to answer the authorities. The appearance of Stephen is amazing. We read in verse 15, Act 6. The council was looking steadfastly at him, at him. And you know how he looked? His face as the face of an angel. His face as the face of an angel. So, though he is under trial, there is glory. We could say glory, isn't it? Where does that glory come from? It comes from God. So in adversity or a tough situation, here is Stephen looking like an angel, meaning bright, shining, glowing, because he's a carrier of the presence of God. He's a carrier of uh, you know, the glory of God. And we could also say that very similar to Jesus. Jesus, he believed, he gave himself completely to the Father. He rested in the Father. We could say that men and women of God trusted God to a great extent. And so his faith rested upon God in this difficult situation or under this trial. So that is why his face shone like an angel. So it's a beautiful testimony about this man. Stephen. Now let's move on to Acts chapter 7 and see what are all the things that are taking place here. Stephen is going to respond, respond to the accusations against him. And uh, as he responds, he points people to Jesus Christ. How does he do it? He knows that he's talking to a Jewish audience. And so he's going to talk about all the fathers of the Jewish 
faith, Abraham, and then he goes on, you know, he'll connect it to Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Solomon, and finally to the Lord Jesus Christ and help people recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. Just think with me, every time the leaders had an opportunity either to speak or something had happened, like the Holy Spirit was poured out or the lame man was made well, they always preached Christ. They took the opportunity to preach Christ. Preach Christ. Now, if this was not enough, even when they were under trial, when they were under trial, they were preaching Christ. Same thing. Stephen is standing before these accusers and his uh, thought process would have been that, okay, I'm going to defend myself and escape from the situation. But he's careful to preach Christ because it's an opportunity. Who knows? These elders, leaders, when they are listening to the gospel, if their hearts are touched, they too will give their lives to God. So that is his uh, uh, motivation. And so he starts to speak. So till about verse four, he is talking about uh, Abraham, you know, who came out. And, um, you know, from there he moved on to the land which the people, the Jews now dwell in. And then, uh, you know, he continues, he continues to talk about Abraham and what happened, how his descendants were uh, under the slavery of the Egyptians. Uh, and then, of course, you know, they uh, came out and uh, God made a covenant with Abraham, covenant of circumcision in verse 8. Um, and uh, later on, Abraham begot Isaac circumcised him and then of course you know come next in the generation is Jacob so he's talking about the patriarch Abraham now he'll continue he'll continue to talk about these people okay yeah so let's just highlight one verse verse 5 in Acts 7 and God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. So uh, he's talking about a portion of land or a piece of land that God had promised, which even Abraham at the time when he was alive, he did not possess it. But he knew that According to God's promise, the descendants, they will come and, you know, at one point they are going to have that piece of land. So God made a promise to Abraham. And then, of course, there was a covenant with Abraham. So uh, verse 8, he gave him the covenant of circumcision. So we know this. It was um, the covenant of circumcision was the one given to Abraham. Uh, this was given before the Mosaic Covenant. So after the Mosaic Covenant, we've studied about the various covenants. So we right now live in the new covenant of the Lord. So he goes on in this way, talks about the descendants of Abraham. And from around verse 9, he starts to talk about Joseph. So there's a mention of Joseph in verses 9 and 10. And here he points out, you know, even while he spoke about uh, Joseph, he's pointing to the fact that it was God who delivered him uh, out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom. So he's giving glory to God for the things that have taken place in the lives of um, men and women. So in this way, you know, there's an account of Joseph and the, he continues like this. He then goes on to talk about Moses and Moses's sort of entire life. You could say that it has been uh, not entire life, but very significant parts of Moses's life uh, have been listed out here. So, you know, he talks about how Moses, he was born um, and uh, he, he was rescued. He was brought up. Uh, in the Pharaoh's palace, 
but when he was 40 years old it came into his heart to deliver his own people so think about this at the age of 40 he had a a, a real stirring in his heart to do what god had called him to do to deliver but then we also know that he did things in his own strength and because of that you know he was not able to deliver the people um, because now he was looked at as a murderer he went ahead and murdered one of the oppressors of the jews uh, and so after this comes the wilderness phase when moses has to go into the wilderness and he hides there when 40 years had passed verse 30 i'm at verse 30 here in uh, uh, act 7 and when 40 years had passed an angel of the lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of mount sinai when moses saw it he marveled at the sight and as he drew near to observe the voice of the lord came to him saying i am the god of your fathers the god of abraham the god of isaac and the god of jacob and moses trembled and dared not look so this is that encounter that moses had with god at the burning bush so at the age of 40 he realized i am the deliverer i have to do something he did it in his own strength and he found himself in a troubled situation now 40 years in the wilderness did Moses need to be in the wilderness? Moses was in the wilderness, right? Was that necessary? Yes? Why? Mike? My opinion is this, like how I understood it is like, uh, like anyway, like God is going to take him, Moses, through the Israelites. So what happened to Israel is like very, like each people are different um, categories, like yeah. they'll mock and all. And what Moses did in uh, wilderness is like the shepherding. Uh -huh. So through that, uh, God trained Moses to lead the people. That's what my opinion. Okay, sure. No, but couldn't he have let the people, uh, if you say, like, without going to the wilderness? Okay. In Egypt. Uh, in Egypt. Also, he was an angry guy. Right. <laughs> so, to get the patience, might be God put it in. God the put him in the wilderness. So, you know, he was in the wilderness, and I agree with all of us. When he was in the school of the wilderness, God taught him many things. He truly uh, learned humility, we could say that. Because even when he came to the burning bush and God gave him a call, he was scared to take it up. But 40 years ago, he was very uh, self-confident. He went ahead and he murdered an Egyptian. So confidence was very high. But that confidence was in himself. But now he's come to the wilderness experience and that humbled him. Okay. Thank God for the good things that happen in the wilderness. But it need not have happened in his life. Had he not murdered that Egyptian, Pharaoh would not be looking for him or people would not be looking for him. So he created a situation in such a way that till those people who were against him were alive, he could not go back into the kingdom. He lost his own opportunity. And that's not God's fault. Had he worked with wisdom at the age of 40, who knows? Who knows? Very soon, God could have said, okay, Moses, you're ready. I... And okay, we, we are not saying that God's timeline changes. There was a certain timeline when God sent them to Pharaoh, Moses to Pharaoh and said, okay, let my people go. God knows how to manage his timeline. But for Moses to go to the wilderness and struggle and suffer, actually there's no need. The point that I'm trying to make is, even in our own lives, we go through wilderness seasons and it's not, it's not God's fault. 
yeah, there are seasons of testing. Like Abraham, God told him, sacrifice Isaac. God does take us through certain tests to mold us, to build us, and based on our response to promote us. However, he does not want us to struggle in the wilderness. Now, we go through that for two reasons. Because maybe somebody else did something that put us in trouble, like Joseph. His brother sold him. What to do now? He has to struggle in Egypt. Or we ourselves, like Moses. He did a very uh, immature thing. Without understanding God's timing, without understanding God's instruction in that time of his life, he went and murdered an Egyptian. So, to protect himself, to save his own life, he had to run. And there, there he was in the wilderness. A lot of nice things happened in the wilderness. Praise God for that. But that is not God's best. Okay, but yeah, he hum he was humbled, and uh, the burning bush encounter took place when God thought that come on, now Moses is ready, I can speak to him. So there was a burning bush, and you know, uh, God spoke to him. So he comes to this burning bush, and God says, "Take off your sandals, for this is a holy this is holy ground." So that was literally God's presence meeting him in the wilderness. That again is very encouraging for us. Sometimes we are in wilderness seasons, but God's presence encounters us. God's call encounters us. And that is so very real. Okay, um, And God gives him an assignment. He says, look, I, uh, you know, I will send you to Egypt. You have to go. You have to speak to Pharaoh. So he receives an assignment from that encounter. So that's a beautiful story of Moses. And uh, Stephen is narrating all these things. So we've seen, he talked about Abraham who came out and God made a covenant. You know, then uh, Isaac, Jacob, finally he's talking about Moses. And we said earlier that though he was a believer in the church, he knew so much about the word of God, the scriptures. So that's an encouragement for each one of us as believers. It doesn't matter, you know, if we are in leadership, we are not in leadership, or you know, if you're a, 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 a whatever, whatever capacity you serve in, like maybe a high capacity. Who was Stephen? He was a simple volunteer, and uh, uh, his duty was serving food. But see how much of the Bible, or let's say the Old Testament scriptures, he knows. So. The apostles during those days would have done a very good job of teaching the believers. Remember, we said the apostles' doctrine and the teachings of Jesus. They were the apostles' doctrine, um, you know, and, and they preached it. They preached it to everyone who was born again. So Stephen was very well trained, and that's what we can see. One more thing in the life of Moses. We were talking about Moses according to Stephen's explanation. We said at the age of 40, it came into his heart that he must deliver the people. Why at the age of 40? Moses already knew that you know his brethren were being oppressed in Egypt. He knew it all along. He was also taken care of by his own mother, isn't it? So he had a heart for the Jews from the beginning. But why is it at the age of 40 that he understands his calling? Why at the age of 40? Why not earlier? Okay, here in the chat. Uh, all right. Th there's a comment here, but maybe it was an earlier comment. 
you see even though there is a call of god on our lives there can be a certain season where we come to the understanding of that call so for moses it happened around that time that's when he clearly understood and uh, here as i'm not we are not reading through the passage but i encourage us to please go back and read the passage when we read here we also see that the way he understood he thought that people will understand that he is the deliverer okay so in this season there was an awareness same thing for all of us it could happen that in a certain stage where we are able to understand very clearly oh okay we have an idea but we are able to understand very clearly what is it that god wants us to do and moses thought that everyone like him understands that he is a deliverer that's when he went ahead and murdered got it but unfortunately the people who saw him do this act did not see him as a deliverer they did not see him as a leader so just because we understand the call of god does not mean that everyone else around us understands the call of god on our lives okay it may take time for people to recognize what god has called us to and therefore we must walk in patience we may feel frustrated that ah oh, god has given me this call and i'm so passionate i want to do all these things but my family is not understanding my church people are not understanding you know or uh, uh, anyone else that god has surrounded you with they are not understanding but don't worry because moses went through the same experience what a mighty call of god he had on his life to lead thousands of people but at the time when it came into his heart it did not dawn on the others that he has a call of god on his life so same thing applies to us others around us may not recognize but we need patience we need to move according to god's timetable when the time comes for them to understand what god has called us to do then you know they may say oh okay that's that's what god is calling you to do go do it we are with you you have our support but up until that time we need patience even moses people did not believe in earlier early on in his journey as a leader so these are all the things that we read about moses so he received god's call uh in the wilderness when he saw the burning bush and god said i am going to send you back to egypt so we are somewhere around was 36 oh we have gone beyond that was 39 would uh, would you like to read one of you you can just read the remainder of what stephen said we'll just quickly read maybe two two verses at a time there are uh, 1 2 4 5 Okay let's let's read the uh, five verses right now so one person can read two verses another person can read three verses uh maybe nina you can read 39 and 40 nikhil could you please read from verse 41 to 43 verse 39 yeah. whom our fathers would not obey but rejected and in their heart they turned back to egypt e- egypt saying to aaron make us gods to go before us as for this moses who brought us out of the land of egypt we don't do not know what he ha- has become of him. okay 
and they made a calf in those days offered sacrifices to to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands then god turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifice during 40 years in the wilderness o house of israel yes you took up the tabernacle of uh, molech and the star of your god remphan image which you made to worship and i will carry you away beyond babylon okay so he is bringing their attention to the fact that moses was such a mighty man of god called by god and they all knew the incidents that the children of israel came out of egypt because of this man moses but he is saying even our fathers were disobedient they did not listen to moses when moses went up to the mountain to spend time with god to receive the law from god the people forced aaron to make a calf whom they could worship so their hearts were hearts that wandered away from the work that god was doing so he's reminding them of that and then you know he goes on to talk about the fact that moses built a tabernacle a tabernacle of worship according to the pattern which was given to him by god yeah and you know then the story continues till the time that you know he says okay our forefathers they traveled and uh, later on a temple was built by solomon so first came the tabernacle then came the temple now verse 48 he slowly trying to bring the conversation to the worship of god or he he wants to point out to the lord jesus that's his attempt so in verse 48 after mentioning the tabernacle and the temple of moses he says however the most high does not dwell in temples made with hands as the prophet says so even when he is making a statement like this he is backing it up with some old testament scripture so he's uh, stating heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool what house will you build for me says the lord or what is the place of my rest has my hand not made all these things so basically he's trying to say that you know though we have so much reverence for the temple and the place and all of that ultimately god is a god who is bigger than the temple who can contain him so in verse 48 that's what he's saying most high does not dwell in temples made with hands and yet and yet you know he's pointing to these people and he's saying you as a people you are not understanding you're not understanding even when it came to the time of moses people resisted moses and today in our times god is doing something and he's saying you always resist the holy spirit as your fathers did which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute and they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers verse 52 who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it so he's pointing to the attitudes of the children of israel that they were persecuting or they were opposing even the people whom god had given as leaders leaders and prophets so he's coming to the point of saying that in our present times you have done the same thing because whom did they oppose okay now we don't know why stephen spoke very strongly but what he was saying are facts maybe they needed to hear it but when he started speaking like this to bring it to the point to say that okay even jesus you have opposed the men around him got very very angry 
So after that, they did not want to listen to him anymore. So when they heard these things, uh, they they were furious. They were furious. Verse fifty four. And even when the crowd is getting angry, what is the situation as far as Stephen is concerned? We said that his wisdom they could not resist. He spoke by the Holy Spirit. His wisdom they could not resist. He is still filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse fifty five. It says, "Being full of the Holy Spirit." What did Stephen do? He gazes into heaven. Okay, he gazes into heaven to see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. It seems like he probably knew that his time had come. The men around him got very, very angry. So he's looking up into heaven, gazing into heaven. How did he see heaven? Now there are many questions we can ask whether. Did he see it through the natural eyes, or are we talking about a vision? Uh, we are not very sure what what could have been the case, but he saw heaven, and in heaven, whom did he see? He saw Jesus, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And there are commentators who say that Jesus standing is a sign of honor. Usually, we read. Sitting at the right hand, Jesus is seated at the right hand. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, and sitting is a, a picture of resting. After finishing the work, Jesus went to heaven. He sat down, but Jesus is standing when Stephen sees him in heaven. So, for a person who is dying for the cause of Christ. Commentators say that this scripture shows, like Jesus honored his child. He honored a martyr. No wonder he was standing up. He was standing up. So that's how they look at it. And he says, once he sees the heavens and seeing Jesus standing up, honoring him as if to welcome him, you know, and say, "Well done, good and faithful servant. I'm ready to receive you." Stephen says, "Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God." So he's telling the audience, "I can see the same Jesus, the same Jesus, okay, whom they are opposing, but he's calling him the Son of Man, the Son of Man. I can see him. He is standing at the right hand of God." And as they heard him say these things. You know they get really angry, and uh, they ran at him at one accord. It says, meaning together, they were so uh, uh, furious that they didn't want anything to do with Stephen. They ran against him. Uh, they started stoning him. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And verse fifty-eight. It's a very interesting verse, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Remember, we said there were elders from different places and also Cilicia. So there is a young man. By that time, is a young man Saul. Why did they lay the clothes at his feet? Because he was one of the leaders. After having completed the task given to them, they are coming to him and saying, "Yeah, we've done it." The job is done. This man is stoned. He's been cast out of the city, and uh, they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, "Lord, receive my spirit." Anyone else who spoke like this? Jesus, yeah, receive my spirit. And sixty, he knelt down, cried out with a loud voice, "Lord, do not charge them." With this sin, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. Can you imagine? These people are stoning him. He's he knows he's dying. Okay, what does it take for a man to say, "Lord, do not charge them with this sin"? Right? It's it's unthinkable. So much of forgiveness in his heart. Just like Jesus, forgive them. They 
don't know what they're doing. That's how Jesus spoke. And here are true disciples of Jesus. And he's praying for the persecutors. Shouldn't he be praying for himself? You and I, I don't know what we would do. Lord, help me, protect me. Maybe that's our prayer. <laughs> right? But he's saying, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. He's praying for them because he knows. Salvation is his. He's safe, secure. Jesus is ready, standing there, welcoming him and saying, okay, Stephen, my child, come, no problem. Okay? So that joy filled his heart. So in trial and persecution, the man Stephen, this is his testimony, such a beautiful testimony, a man of wisdom and of signs, wonders. In but standing before the council, his face was shining like that of an angel. And then he's able to answer. His wisdom, nobody's able to resist. He's talking about everyone with accuracy. Abraham, Moses. And then finally he says, look, our fathers are post. And you are becoming like the same thing. You're rejecting. You're resisting the work of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, uh, like betrayers and murderers of those whom God sent. So he's proclaiming the truth to the people. And even when it comes to the last part of being stoned, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's able to see, look into the spirit realm, look at what God is showing him in those last moments, and finally forgive his own persecutors. Okay, so it's a powerful, powerful testimony of a man who represented Christ in his times, the first martyr who's being recorded. Do you think he was proud to die for Jesus? Earlier we saw the uh, leader said they were happy to suffer for, for Christ. What about Stephen? Was he pr proud or was he happy to die for the Lord? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that was the kind of conviction that uh, Stephen carried. So any thoughts, any questions on, you know, people who undergo persecution or who are martyred? Should we seek to be martyred? Like, okay, I want to be a martyr. <laughs> huh? It's a tough decision. Yeah. Okay, there can be many answers to that question. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't think we need to ask for it. Like, if it happens, then you can't help it. Uh, but uh, I don't think we should go seeking after it. Yeah. Yeah. Like if something happened like that, we're not going for seek for the but if happened, yes. that's good only. That's good. Yeah, that's what we saw. It's good. So because Jesus is happy, like huh? For God. Right. Like persecution will happen because of God only. Yeah. Like not because of in that sentence. Like because I'm doing for God. Right. I'm living for God. Yes. Simply they will not come and do. For. So in one side, like it's a like if I say like if suddenly it's happened somewhere, I yes. can't do anything where it's good. Correct. But it's not like I'll go and do such kind of things because God gave me wisdom also. I know. I know. Yeah. Yes, yes ma'am. That's correct. Great. Thank you. Yeah. We need to understand that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's a comment here. Uh, it says, uh, sometimes one can be persecuted by their own family. Uh, apart from prayer, what can a believer do? Uh, it's a tough question. I think we must keep praying and ask God for wisdom and protection. Because it's like a day-to-day -day thing, right? You can't even escape it. It's your own house. When you go back into the house, it's like you're getting back into the battlefield. But pray for wisdom and pray for uh, a heart of forgiveness. We saw how Stephen forgave. 
so heart of forgiveness uh, and then fast and pray for the salvation and good understanding of the family members hopefully you know they will uh, come out of this and they will also serve the lord all right so uh, prince is saying if one is martyred to die is gain to die is gain okay you know all the disciples they were martyred we saw that right peter apostle peter mighty preacher and all we've seen all the sermons he was crucified upside down and he was killed apostle paul missionary journey is this that beheaded ha huh? so it's but i'm sure uh, like stephen whenever it happened to them uh, maybe god prepared their hearts and uh, so comforting even for stephen to see a vision at that point it must have comforted him that heaven is a reality god is real don't worry about this mortal body stephen eternity is ours so i'm sure god would have prepared their hearts in such a way that they could uh, take it up so if it happens we're not going looking for it but if it happens i'm sure the lord will give us the grace and the strength uh, to be a martyr so that's the story of stephen let's uh, close with a word of prayer would any one of us like to lead in prayer please Yeah, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much once again for this wonderful morning, and Lord, thank you so much for your wonderful word, of Lord, and thank you for us teaching us, my Father God. Lord, help us to learn more and equip more for you and to do your kingdom, my Father God, to build your kingdom, my Father God. Lord, we thank you for everything, Lord. We thank you for the faculties. I thank you for ma'am, my Father God. All glory belongs to you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you everyone.